Father, we commit this morning to you and pray for your spirit to guide the preaching of your word as well as our hearing and understanding. Help us to see what is your will by faith and obey it by your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we had to deal with Noah's drunkenness, his nakedness, and the apparent exploitation of that by Ham and very possibly his son Canaan, um, and then the rescue of his honor by Noah's other two sons, Shem and Japheth. This is really the continuation of that message. Uh, and half an hour doesn't really do it justice. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened there, but it was enough for Noah by the following curses and blessings to reveal the divine destiny of his three sons and their children and the nations that would come from them uh, over the centuries. So this morning, having got as far as verse 23, we'll now be considering first the curses for Canaan, verse 24 to 25, and secondly, the blessings for Shem and Japheth, verse 26 to 27, and third, an intro to chapter 10, for, uh, 9, verse 28 to 10, verse 1, and that will lead us into chapter 10, hopefully, um, in the next few weeks. But first, um, curses for Canaan, verse 24 to 25 of chapter 9. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. Have we got the sound on in the other room? Can you make sure it is? Okay. So Ham may have thought that he could get away with somehow abusing his father, but Noah, I guess, had not been as senseless as he'd counted on. Plus his other sons, no doubt, had informed. So when he awoke from his wine, verse 24, he was faced with the hangover of realizing what his youngest son had done to him. Now, we don't really want to go in too much into what that might have been. Uh, I refer to last week. Um, but he might have been just looking at him and spreading the word. Uh, there might have been some abuse going on. Human nature doesn't change, does it? But we'll, we'll, we won't know. Um, remember that sin of gossip and repeating an offense. The Bible is not salacious, neither should we be. It's modest in the way it presents sin. Uh, it may only mean that Ham had reported and discussed his father's nakedness. But anyway, Noah had been grievously sinned against by Ham. Exodus 20 verse 12, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And on top of that, we should see that a rift is developing between Ham and his brothers, not unlike that of Cain and Abel. Fortunately, this time, Ham is outnumbered as the bad guy. Anyway, on finding out what happened, Noah made this prophetic pronouncement in the form of a prayer. Verse 25, never underestimate the power of speech in the Bible. It literally binds and looses. Noah has been presented thus far as a man of few words, but now, provoked and exasperated, he is free with his curses. And he seems to have the backing of the Lord for them. These curses, as well as the later blessings, they have the force of decree and of prophecy. Noah was a patriarch with authority. He was also a man of God. And what he said was, cursed be not Ham, but Canaan, Ham's fourth son. What's he got to do with it? Was Canaan already growing up with his father's perverted inclinations? Was he in some way an accessory to Ham's sin? Or possibly this is a curse on younger sons to be inherited down the line of youngest sons from Ham onwards. There are various theories that have been adduced. Some are rather extreme and I won't mention them, but refer you maybe to Leviticus that we talked about last week. Uh, but the Bible doesn't tell us directly. It gives us the two and two, the euphemisms, but without putting them together. And it seems inconsistent with Noah calling Canaan by name immediately on waking up if he wasn't there already. Uh, the reason's not revealed. All we know is that Ham has eaten sour grapes and Canaan's teeth will be set on edge. Canaan is condemned by Noah and therefore destined to be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. And so now we, we are dealing with the Bible's first mention of slavery. Was there slavery before the flood? 
Very likely. It was a lawless world, but so is this one. What is the Bible's attitude to slavery? How can we express that? It's certainly a form of abuse. It's certainly an evil in the sense of unpleasantness, rather like leprosy or deformity. But nevertheless, it's in the world as a product of sin and the fall. God permitted it to Israel, not because he approved of it, but because their hearts were so hard as to insist on the practice, like the other nations. God hates slavery like he hates divorce. But it became a social norm in the ancient world. To become a slave or servant was often the last hope of the financially ruined or the outcast. Luke 15, 15 to 16, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. So slavery came to provide something like what the welfare state does now, but only of a very basic and often brutal kind. The slave had no rights, but was regarded as property. But of course, we still saw uh, in Colossians, Paul asking slaves to be good slaves and masters to be good masters. He didn't thoroughly denounce that relationship, but he, he knew that they should treat each other rightly. So it was sin, but so was the kind of impropriety that often landed people in that state. Um, these days they'd be on the dole or uh, in trouble. God does not choose to minutely police the whole world in real time, but he will be the just judge at the end of everyone's life. And so the thought we leave you with for that is, is that anyone you've been treating inappropriately? The Canaanites we learn, as the books of Moses progress, were an especially corrupt people, practicing drunken orgies as part of pagan worship, sacrificing infants to their demon gods, and so on. Leviticus 18.3, do not follow the practices of the people of Egypt where you once lived, or of the people in the land of Canaan, where I'm now taking you. So they were already slaves to sin, long before Israel made slaves of them. Joshua 17.13, when the Israelites grew stronger, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not dispossess them. And that was sin on Israel's part, because they were supposed to fully drive them out of the land. So it's complex. It's difficult, but the point is it starts here in Genesis 9. Then we have, secondly, the blessings for Japheth and Shem in verse 26 to 27. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his slave. So on the other hand, Noah pronounces blessings concerning his other two sons. Verse 26, first, the Lord, the God of Shem, is blessed, rather than Shem himself. In other words, Shem had adopted the right beliefs of his father's line in Yahweh, the creator God, with whom a relationship is essential for blessing. In all our righteous acts, God receives the glory, for it is he who works through us. We have nothing good to claim for ourselves. At best, we are unprofitable servants. We have done no more than our duty. Yet in Christ, we are regarded as having his righteousness, thanks to his taking the punishment for our sins. That is the glory of the gospel. We receive freely what we could never earn or attain. Then Noah prays to this God that Canaan may be the slave of Shem. Now, Israel, of course, came from the line of Shem, and about a thousand years later, fulfilled this prophecy when the prayer was answered, as Israel took the land and became dominant. But there's more to this spiritually. There's, the, there's a principle that the meek will inherit the earth, that there are temporal as well as eternal rewards for obedience to God that the unbelieving are in bondage to Satan, yet that in Christ the captives are set free. So these things are not just historical. They apply on the spiritual level to where we are 
with the Lord. And then we have a blessing on Noah's other worthy son, Japheth. Verse 27, as Noah prays that his territory would be extended. That's a play on his name. And it wasn't all that difficult with only three families in the world, but it's, it may be significant. Um, as in the rest of this prayer, there, there is much play on words that sound alike in the Hebrew with the son's names uh, that's lost in any translation. But Japheth apparently will have many children and eventually spread out far and wide, at least after the Babel incident. Uh, and we read in 1 Chronicles 1, 5 to 7, the same more or less as what we do in chapter 10. 1 Chronicles 1, 5 to 7. The sons of Japheth, Goma, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Goma, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togama. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, the Kittim, and the Rodanim. So the, um, the people who wrote these genealogies, they focus on particular ones of these sons, giving them a few further generations. Um, and we think that Tarshish is thought to be somewhere in Western Europe. Kittim is definitely Greece, uh, which came into play, of course, later in the Old Testament and was the language was dominated by the New Testament. So Japheth's descendants seem to have mainly moved west into Europe. Uh, and as we'll see from chapter 10, given birth to what became Greco-Roman and finally Western civilization. The name Japheth was possibly corrupted into Jupiter for the purpose of pagan ancestor worship. This branch of humanity generally matches with what ethnologists and linguists associate with the Indo-European branch of humanity. And very likely the Sea Peoples or the Philistines would come from Japheth among others. And that would mean conflict with Israel, but on the whole, there would be peaceful coexistence between the descendants of Shem and Japheth. The Japhethites represent most of the Gentiles of the New Testament, many of whom came to faith in Christ, the Lion of Judah, and thereby lived in the tents of Shem. Canaan, on the other hand, though not Ham in general, once again would be Japheth's slave or servant. And future history would play out in this way, especially when the Israelites and the Philistines simultaneously occupied the land formerly claimed by Canaan. I dare say there are other interpretations. Let me just put on record that I utterly reject that which justifies the enslavement of certain races by certain others. While at the same time there is a spiritual dimension to world history, there is a bondage to Satan that impedes na national development and makes a people vulnerable to those benefiting from the discipline of knowing God and receiving his grace. So what is it that exalts a nation? Righteousness. What causes its reproach? Sin. And, and this accounts for many of the cycles of empire and revolution that have been over the millennia. We must be aware of those principles and yet compassionate to those who might, might suffer its consequences. And these days, I suppose we should fear for the continued independence of our own nation, given its descent into open sin, resembling Canaan more than it does Japheth. Like in the days of James II, when uh, Macaulay called him the slave of France, bankrolled by Louis XIV. God has his hand on world history, and he's working his purposes out through it. Will the Ukrainians become the slaves of the Russians? Will the Russians become the slaves of the Western powers or of China? You know, sometimes the alternatives seem equally bleak. But God is in full control. And I'm pleased he hasn't put you or me in charge of it. He is pulling the strings, not Putin or, or Biden or whoever. Um, but note also that this verse constitutes a further messianic prophecy that builds on Genesis 3.15. Remember, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And the seed of that woman will be carried by the house of Shem, whom we know to this day as the Semitic peoples. That group includes the Arabs, as well as the Israelites, and those others living in the Near East. But the promise is not restricted to the Semites. Others will dwell in their tents. 
even as their servants or special guests, but the whole of mankind would be blessed through them and from that seed when he came. And as we read in the New Testament, there is a positive spin on being a bond slave of Jesus Christ and his gospel. Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So Canaan now symbolically represents unbelievers in general, highlighting the great divide between the saved who dwell in the tents of Shem and the unsaved who have no part therein, the stark dichotomy of belief, attitude, behavior, and destiny. That's what it means far more than anything political or racial. So thirdly, uh, we introduce chapter 10 by reading 9 verse 28 to 10, 1. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Altogether, Noah lived 950 years and then he died. This is the account of Shem, Ham and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. So after the flood, Noah lived another 350 years. Verse 28, that was the, th the final third of his life. But all we know about this period are his sacrifice and then his drunken nudity. It's not a very flattering epilogue, even though he's far better known for his heroism at the time of the flood. Yes, he was greatly used by God there, but altogether Noah lived to the age of 950, verse 29, and then he died, bringing to a close that genealogy of pre-flood patriarchs that began in chapter 5. So that is finally closed off. He was the last to get above 900. Something had changed. Human lifespans got less. Something had changed either about the environment or that the quality of the human genome. The entropy of mutations is still worsening. A ticking time bomb for the human race, which before long possibly will not be able to reproduce unless science can help it along. But the bottom line is man is mortal and he is mortal because he is a sinner. The wages of sin, Romans 6.23, is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in chapter 10 verse 1 the account then begins of the generations of Shem, Ham and Japheth, Noah's sons who themselves had sons after the flood. Chapter 10 will describe how the different groups post-Babel came to occupy certain geographical territories. The word Toledoth means the, the family history or genealogy coming from these three men. And it's generally used to start a new heading in these histories. And the section has come to be known as the Table of Nations, as it explains how many of the nations of the time of Moses, and some still existing today, came into being, having branched out from Noah's sons. Shem was possibly the firstborn, although the uh, English rendering of 10 verse 21 might suggest otherwise, but in fact the, the Hebrew word order doesn't make it very clear. But either way, we know that Shem, not the others, was the ancestor of Christ in his human nature. And we know from uh, verse 9 verse 27 that there's a, there's a prophecy here about it being possible for Gentiles to dwell in the tents of Shem, and we should take that to mean living in Christ, the seed promised to Eve, which must come through the line of Shem. Which means that if you've lived the life of Ham and Canaan, in Jesus Christ, you can dwell in the tents of Shem and find the blessing of God instead of the curse of sin and death. That's what we call, among other things, conversion, regeneration. Justification by faith, adoption by God into his family. And so we finish with thanks because God still draws sinners to himself in love, undoing the curse, transforming their lives. And it's only possible when we surrender our lives to Jesus. He is the one who can change our eternal destiny. Even if we think of it as foreordained from one of agony and horror, to one of unimaginable glory and joy that we do not deserve. Praise be to God that there is still hope for the hams of this world 
what some of us were, but we were washed in the blood of the Lamb. And he is able to keep us from falling and give us the victory over temptation and sin, sanctifying us by his Spirit until we are perfected in him. Well, that's as far as we've got. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus Christ to conquer death, that last enemy of ours, by going to the cross. We thank you for your unspeakable gift of mercy, sending him on that dreadful mission, all to take away our sins, so that we could be forgiven and live with you forever. Why would a holy God want to do that for us? What is man that you should be mindful of us? Well, Father, we commit our lives to you and we trust in Jesus as our saviour. We ask your wisdom in dealing with the world and our own sin. Lord, it can be a bewildering journey, as it no doubt was for those early generations. But help us to trust in you for the provision of all that we need. We thank you that you are such an abundant provider in this life as well as the next. And help us, we pray, to walk worthy of the great calling you have given us as, as witnesses and ambassadors for Jesus' sake. Amen.